Thank you very much. Good afternoon and thanks for the chance to talk to you um, and thanks to Adam for organising this remarkable event. Uh, you know, started, you know, someone had the balls basically to say why don't we make the first of March around the World Futures Day. Um, here we are in Melbourne having our second one of these. You probably don't realise it, but amongst the Futures community, um, we actually have got a 24-hour Futures Day running around the world as the sun travels, um, hosted by two of our world associations, the, the World Futures Study Federation and the Association of, of, of um, Professional Futurists, um, are basically hosting a 24 log on conversation around um, Future Days and some of our graduates and alumni and friends are participating in that. But yeah, look, I've come along today, Adam asked me to come along the last one, I couldn't do it because I was teaching and as Adam said, just down the road we've got a very small university called Swinburne, yes. inside a, a faculty of business we've got a very, very small program called the Master of Strategic Foresight and uh, I'm happy to say that Next week we will be undertaking our 14th year of teaching foresight and futures thinking to people. Which I'm pretty excited about. And then around the room there's actually a bunch of my graduates and students. You want to just put your hand up and embarrass yourself? Because if, you if you want to know more about the program, look for these people and call them. If you want to know more about the program, if you want to know about the program talk to them because that because they're certainly the best product. <laughs> And I actually don't want to talk about technology, even though we're actually here to talk about science technology in the future, but I actually want to talk to you about certainly what my experience and what we teach at Foresight about how we get people to engage with this notion about the future. Um, how, is it, how is it we ourselves find the future exciting and interesting? But also for when you are trying to talk to someone about something that excites you, how do you get them excited as well? Because certainly professionally, I've seen a situation, and certainly people who've done my courses in a situation where they want to talk about the future and their audience actually doesn't find it, they actually don't want to have the conversation. And as one of my students wrote, who was a lawyer, he'd go back to his law practice to talk about his studies and the shutters would come down over people's faces as he wanted to talk about this. So what was that about? What do we know about this idea of people engaging with the future? And I've just got a couple of things I want to talk about because for me the key, and I'm going to, so this as you know writing on the whiteboard is immediately something that people become dyslexic. But I want to talk about resilience because the key thing about futures and foresight at a personal level is am I feeling resilient in the face of what is happening? Because the future happens. It's not planned, it's not designed, it's people creating remarkable things. Scientists like we had you know, before in the morning, entrepreneurs out there, things happening, the, the world itself deciding some things are going to happen to us. And in this, we as people, we have to respond. And organisations have to respond. And how does that response work? And what does it look like when people respond? Well, and what is it when people actually become overpowered or just can't deal with it? And this notion of resilience, what I call personal resilience. Also, resilience can be organisational, it can be societal. Now, a great guy, Chris Snyder, at the University of Kansas, who came out of the positive psychology movement, studied a notion of what he called future, futures hope. This notion that one of the most powerful conative motivations that humans can have is this ability to find hope in the most remarkable situations. If anyone there knows the story of Viktor Frankl and the prison camps in World War II, that is the living embodiment of a person who could find hope in the most extreme situations. And Frankl himself writes and talks about the fact that when he saw the prisoners lose hope, they died shortly afterwards. And for him, what kept him going and actually was part of what got him out of the prison camp and then onto his career as a psychologist at Vienna University was this notion that there would be a point beyond this. Snyder studied future hope and he's found two key things go into a person being hopeful about the future. They're quite distinct things and the things I want to talk about because I think if we're interested in the future, partly it's because the future talks to us in these areas and if we want to engage with people, we need to understand that they need to have the capacity to actually respond to this as well. And those two things 
a personal agency, and pathways thinking. When a person, I'll ask you, what's it like when a person feels they have personal agency in the face of what's going on around them? What's it like when yeah, you like when you feel agency? Feels satisfaction. Feels good. Feels that because you feel you whatever it is is happening. I can do something about it. I can respond. I can respond effectively. I can influence it. I can respond to whatever. But personal agency is that strong sense. It is actually a self-talk process. It's actually something you say to yourself with your friends who you might see drop their belief in their ability to respond. What do friends often do to someone who's kind of dropped the bundle a bit? when they're actually feeling they actually can't respond, what do friends tend to do? You can do it because they, because they remind them of things they've done before. They say, look, the things we've done before. And bit by bit, we pick one another up. So this notion of personal agency, efficacy, motivation, is a, is a strong self-belief. And it's a big part of what the future calls on people because if the future is dramatically different and the future is unknown and cannot be studied as Colin was showing, it, yeah, it's not a static thing. It's not waiting out there to be studied. It's actually happening. We're all creating it. There's no one in charge of the future. So how do you find, how do you respond to that? Well, a big thing you draw on is this notion of personal agency. Where do you find agency? Can agency be learned? Can agency be taught? Or are some people just born agentic and others not? What's your sense of that? Can people learn agency? I mean, my, in my experience, it's one of the most contagious things you can have to hang around with someone who's got agency, because I'll give it to you. Similarly, if you're with people and you want them to have an agency, then show agency yourself. If people look at the future and start getting scared by it and want to shut it down and want to run away, the best thing you can do is show that you're not scared and you actually find this exciting or interesting or say, hey, there's stuff we can do. So it's that, it's, it's that model of behaviour that people look for, because they find it in themselves. So this is this notion of personal agency. When you're talking about the future, and you're talking about the most dramatic developments in science and technology and everything else, just remember this, that when you're talking about the future being dramatically different, what you're asking your audience to do is to imagine whether they have agency in that future. And, and one of the reasons they start to shut down is you're taking away their agency. Not, I don't mean deliberately taking from them, but they're actually, they're, they're actually trying to imagine this future and they actually don't know what they could do. They start to get scared by it. They say, I don't know what I can do in relation to that future. Not, they're not actually against you. They're not actually against your idea. They're actually starting to get, if you like it, a little bit scared about what they can do in that situation. So one of the things I would say to you, if, it, if you want to talk about the future and, and technology, and you are excited by a technology or development like we saw with cell work or anything else, is to understand that your audience really want to see their agency in that future that you're talking about. How is this good for me? What can I do in this? That's a big part of, 50% actually of what hope goes into. The other thing is this notion of pathways thinking, a completely different idea. This is not the self-talk of, I can do it. I'll ask you again. If someone's got really good pathways thinking, what do you think that, what can a person do who's got really good pathways? What are they sort of, strategy. how do they talk? What are they talking about? Strategy and planning. Hmm? I said strategy and planning. Yeah, strategy and planning. Um, they can find a way to, to their future. Yeah. And in fact, they can see many ways. I mean, I teach entrepreneurs at Swinburne University and you know, sort of, you know, God love entrepreneurs. They are generally often scale and personal agency. They're often not great at pathways thinking. Which means the entrepreneur wants to get there and knows the future the entrepreneur is going to create and it knows the path to get there and, you, and that's the path and I'm on it. And then halfway down the path, the brick wall lands. Your quintessential entrepreneur does what when a brick wall lands in front of them? Mm -hmm. They back up, <laughs> they get a good run and jump and they try and knock the wall down. Because that's the way to get to the future. And sometimes some of the most remarkable entrepreneurs knock walls down all the time. My view is walls can hurt. A pathways thinker, of course, when the brick wall lands, what's a pathways thinker do? Because there's many ways. There's many ways. I mean, if we agree to, if we agree to meet in Sydney, 
There's many ways that we can get to Sydney. There's many options to get there. The pathways is this real ability to see the options available, the many ways we can get to this future. The agency is the self-belief that I can actually bring this about. The two together give you what Snyder called high hope. So basically, if I've got high here and high here, then I've got high hope. And put simply, high hope means whatever the future throws at you, whatever, whatever emerges in the world, what does a high hope person do to respond to it? I mean, what tools can a high hope person bring to bear? Self-belief and pathways. I've got, I've got many ways I can use this idea. I've got many things I can do with it. So once again, back to this notion. If you're talking to someone who's got high agency, but they're actually looking at you as if yeah, you've got two heads, or what are you talking about, or what is this technology? The second thing that can be going on for your audience is to do with their pathways. So what's that about? When a person doesn't get you or isn't interested, and pathways is the problem, why is that? They understand the technology, they understand the... But what don't they know? They can't see how it's going to affect them. Exactly. They want a pathways conversation. Show me how this is useful. Show me how this could be applicable. Show me a way that with, where this is being done. Oh, okay, you want a pathways conversation. Yeah, fine, I know what you... You can talk to your audience and listen to what they're asking for. There are people, of course, who have become mixtures of... So I talk about the entrepreneurs who are high and low here. There's another characteristic of people, and that's the person who's low, who's high in pathways and low in personal agency. I'll ask you this question. Do you know anybody who can tell you everything they could do and never does any of them? They can lay out all the options available. They can tell you all the things they can do from this particular point. They don't need more pathways. <laughs> they need a bit, of the, a bit of the agency conversation. So for me, when, when we teach, when we engage with people about the future, and we're trying to get people interested, excited, informed, educated, we're really playing this game of talking to our audience, it might be our partner, it might be our organisation, it might be our friends, and we're looking for people to respond the way that we feel. But if we really pay attention to what our audience is kind of pushing back at us, we actually can think of more skillful ways to kind of get the conversation across. And even ourselves, this of course comes back on ourselves. If someone's talking about a future and you don't like the future and you want to push their idea of the future away, then what's going on for you when that happens? What is it when you get, when you want to reject someone's notion of the future? What's going on there? I don't like that idea. Someone comes along and says, I reckon the global energy system is going to fall apart, and I reckon that you know, sort of, uh, that, you know, modern civilization, we know it's going to find it pretty tough, and I reckon we're going to start breaking down the complex societies we've built into simpler ones. Now, for some of you, you go, yeah, way to go. But some of you are going to be going, that doesn't sound too flash. Stupid idea. What's that, what's that rejection of someone's notion about the future telling you about yourself? Takes away my agency. Hmm. Maybe it's a future that you don't think you can do anything in. Maybe it's a future that if you're in it, you wouldn't know what to do. Maybe that's the conversation you've got to have. Because if someone wants to talk about that as our future, I might point out to you that it's for the bulk of the world, they're present. <laughs> And they do okay, within reason. So, that's pretty much, as I say, for me, just the simple notion of personal resilience in the face of significant change. At a personal level, and at a level of the people that you want to engage with, it's really your ability to talk across these two dimensions. Agency and pathways, always, to create in people a sense of hope, a sense that they can, this sounds like a future they could engage with, work with, have options in, have a life in, have a job in, raise families in, that kind of thing. 
that's kind of what I really wanted to say because I figure of all the things you're hearing about, you mightn't get a chance to hear some of that stuff. So that's kind of my uh, formal, but at this point I kind of said to Adam, I'm happy to kind of take questions, questions, yeah. comments, anything and kind of go with it because I know there's a I know we've got Patrick coming on after me, so I don't yeah. want to. Oh look, look, we've got time. So, um, so, I mean, to, in, in terms of like a foresight thinking, mm. you've spoken about like how sort of attitudes that people can have in order to develop um, like a, you know, a, a more robust foresight. Mm. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's this, it's this notion of resilience. Yeah. I mean, people who are good futures thinkers are by the nature highly resilient. Now, some future thinkers who are highly resilient can be really strong in agency but actually blow in pathways. They'll actually learn that about themselves because suddenly someone will come along and say, what about this is a pathway? And they go, and, and immediately they want to then back away from it. And my notion and what I try to teach the people is when you are starting to want to back away from a notion of the future, lean into it. It's telling you more about you than it's telling about you about the person who's giving you that information. This is always the notion because we create the future in, in our own minds. So when you, when you lean towards an idea, it's telling you something about you. Similarly, when you start backing away, it's telling you a lot about you. From that knowledge of what it tells you about you, take that knowledge into how you talk to other people about the future. But the best teacher for you about how they respond is to use yourself. Sure. If you have this pathway thinking or problem solving yes. style of thinking, yes. uh, I think that the, um, the, the motivation or the personal agency comes automatically. Of course, of course, yes. It, comes, it just happens. Yes. I mean, I think it does. But you've got to work with nature all the way through, and as you say, yes. you know, when you hit something, you go around it. Yes. Now look, I think it's a very good point. There's another thing though, which I'll just play back to you, is that if someone has had a pathway that has worked in the past, success in the past tends to say, well, that's the only way to get to the future. And often this is why, as Colin talked about, the most unsuccessful people to understand the future coming were people who'd been successful in the past and then couldn't imagine the future being different. It's almost like success itself locks you into a pathway and locks you into a sense of agency. I mean, if you've got a CV that says, here's, here's all the things I've done, it's very hard to get off that CV. Which is why beginners or people who aren't, rep who aren't reputation bound are often some of the best futures thinkers because I haven't got reputation tied up in this. I'll go with any idea. I'll give anything a shot. And then as you get successful, it's actually harder to actually move outside of your successes. I mean, success, I mean, look, I'm, I'm not against success, but far from it. But success can make you quite narrow. But you're quite right. If, you, if, if a pathway works, the agency certainly feeds off it. Yes, you're certainly right. You can't preconceive the goals, though. You've got to allow the project itself yeah. to develop the yeah. which are natural, reasonable, feasible, and all that. Yeah. Uh, two comments. Um, firstly, uh, pathways thinking. Um, there's, a, there's a, a sort of a, I suppose, an intuitive sort of notion of, of thinking forward a planning, um, you can also have an idea um, and you want to work back, you, want to, you, you work back to see, and you're asking the question, um, why is this not feasible, yes. for example, yes. yeah? Yes. So I, I'm asking if you're thinking of both of those, yes, both of those notions, yes. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly the pathway going forward, there's the logical from here to the future, there is the wonderful process which in our language is called backcasting, which is to imagine yourself in a future where, and this is typically with a problem situation. Imagine, if, if, if we're facing a problem now, can I imagine a future where the problem has been addressed? Can I describe that future? Yes, okay, now, can I tell the history of how we got to this point? Going backwards. A good example, this is um, real sci-fi stuff. Uh, an anti-gravity drive, now, some people will say, that's not possible, it's not, it, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not uh, within the um, current physical, um, <laughs> uh, it's just not feasible in, within quantum mechanics or general relativity. But if you actually ask them the question, well, at what point is it in unfeasible? 
Uh, I don't hear a lot of answers to that. That's just an example, that sort of thing. Uh, one other, I'm oh, just sorry, diverging off. Um, I just wonder um, whether, to what extent, uh, uh, I hope this won't sort of sound uh, sort of a bit uh, anti-scholastic, but to what extent does modern tertiary education actually kill people's curiosity, which must be a part of, surely it must be a part of, 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 of this sort of um, way of thinking. Hmm. Any of my um, graduates want to offer a, an opinion on whether tertiary education actually is almost not teaching us to kind of do this? Just an initial response, just a, a, a uh, completely personal. I think what people were saying there, uh, if you're thinking futures, you're resilient. You, you've got, there's some, so that's a, uh, a metaphor, if you will, for you've got some innate capacities. Yeah? And so if you've got some innate capacities, tertiary education ain't going to kill that. Yeah? Just like if you've got some innate capacities doing 100 metre races, you know, no amount of, you know, I'm going to break a leg, or that's not going to hold you back. It might delay things. It might refocus you for a little bit going through 20s and marriage and all that sort of stuff. But in the end, that's going to shine through. I, I just wonder whether as a group you are actually representative. I'm, I, I'm thinking perhaps if you did a survey in a tertiary institution and you said, uh, well, if you're not, um, you're not going to get a qualification out of studying this and uh, it's not going to lead to a, um, it's not going to lead to a uh, vocational um, to, a, to a, a vocational qualification or a scholastic um, uh, qualification, uh, would you actually have any interest in this? And I often wonder whether how you know what the actual percentage of uh, would be, like you know how high would be the percentage of people that would would take any interest in the subjects that they're studying. Can I just add, sort of the previous question? Just reflecting on that. I, having done a couple of degrees and this one now, the thing that I reflect on is that I, I wasn't taught to think critically. I was taught to, to remember uh, in the first degree that I did. And part of that was innovation. And so I suppose what I got a lot out of um, the Foresight program was to, 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 to look beyond what I was looking at. Um, so you imagine a, a, a fish bowl with water, and the fish is swimming in the, in the water, the fish doesn't know it's in the water until it jumps out of it and to be able to reflect and look back and see what's going on. I think that's probably what's lacking in, mm -hmm. in universities. So how typically you go? I, I, well, I'm, 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 I'm,
which we inherit, which we inherit historically, but we project upon the future. And having said that, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yeah. And, and how do you address that without sort of yeah, shattering? Yeah, they're actually over their agency. Yeah, look, that's a great question. Um... Once again, I think, I mean, I think once again, I think what Paul said, I mean, one of the things that I think helps a person have a healthy balance also is this notion of reflection. This, this notion of my agency is wonderful and I have been successful, but the future actually holds no promises there. The notion that things that have worked may not work in the future, those notions of what's failed in the past may work in the future. I'm not going to call it modesty, but there's a notion that kind of comes to the sense that if you've got, I think the Greeks called it hubris, and you believe that you are godlike, then of course, as the Greeks then tell us, that's simply the, that's the second before you step on the banana peel. So I don't think we ever wish it on a person that they actually slip on the banana peel. I trust that the world and its complexity, if you find a person who's so convinced they're right and so convinced of their agency, you kind of try to say maybe and perhaps and watch out for the banana skin. Um, I, as I said, I, if, if they don't wish to reflect on themselves, they won't. If they don't wish to think in a different way, they won't. One thing you almost cannot do is bang on a door where the person won't open it. And my advice is if you bang on the door harder, they just hold onto the door tighter. So the notion that if someone doesn't like this way, won't go there, doesn't want to do that, is back away, just back away. But you've already sowed the seeds of them possibly coming back to you to say, what was that again? So this is a slow process, almost set at the pace of the person that you're working with. Um, yeah. Do you find that some people seem to have this massive amounts of personal agency, whereas in actual fact, it's a, it's a defense mechanism against their own personal sense of inadequacy? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I think, look, I think you're right. I think, once again, there's, there's a sense of agency that is really the bravado and the kind of, the way of not stopping and reflecting on. And for some people, and this is in no way a pejorative comment, some people would prefer to simply just keep going forward than actually stop and reflect on where they've been. They, they actually are driven to keep moving. And that's fine. But then you, can, then you can become your own, you, you're sort of living in your own world, running your own process. And once again, I can't ask a person to stop and reflect. Life as it is, and as we live and learn and fail and all those other things, life gives us many junctures to kind of ask us to pause. So, but yes, you're, you're quite right. And once again, if that's how people are, then... Yeah. And aside, a helpful comment, and then wish them well on their way. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask, conversely, how, do you have any tips on how to create more personal agency? Um, well, number one, hang around with people who have, who have agency is a huge part of it. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the key things, it doesn't come out of foresight, it just comes out of basic you know, psychology and motivation. One of the best ways to get agency, I find, is to... Is to I, ha I have a little trick which I ask people to do if I get someone who's... Which is to find five people who you know and you respect. And go to those five people and ask them what they hope for your future. I mean, people who know you. I mean, they might know all that well. But what do they hope for your future? What is their ambition for you? And I'll tell you things about you that I suspect you're going to say, gee, I hadn't thought that about me. Because often we don't think these things about ourselves. And this notion of opening yourself up to other people 
Because often we are our hardest judge on whether we can do something. And that's fine. But there's also, if we often talk to people, people actually say, you actually are, you could do that, or I can, you know, so, want to build your agency, let people talk about you and listen to what they're saying. So we've spoken a lot about like uh, building characteristics mm -hmm. um, that will enable you to be uh, more likely to uh, achieve a better future yep. for you. Yep. Um, how do you do that with groups of people? Um, well, once again, you have to have a degree of permission to have a conversation. There has to be a degree of support that it's appropriate to spend some time thinking about the future, not just doing the planning, but ask the questions that are the future questions, the pathway questions. I mean, one of the great things to do pathways in an organisation is to talk scenarios. What would we do if what would we do if if this was a situation? In fact, one of the ways I I recommend you ask the question about the future, particularly in organisations, is to ask the success question. If this was happening in the world, how do we succeed in it? Not fail. How do we succeed? What's it like? How are we successful in a world where the government has, you know, where this has happened, where our funding's been cut? How are we successful in a world where, you know, this is happening? And ask people to sit down and think about how they would be successful rather than fail, because fail is the default. And, and then from that, people go, well, actually, we, you know, we can do that. Yeah, it's actually that, that notion of that's a pathway that we can actually succeed in. That's, that's not a future for us to run away from. It's actually a future for us to say, you know, bring it on. Um, but in groups, uh, once again, there, it has to be, people have to be up for the conversation. They've got to feel as though it's a, a good use of their time. Um, people have got to feel supported in the process. But people are up for these conversations. I mean, I don't find any shortage of people in organisations who aren't up for a conversation about the future being uncertain. I mean, people are intelligent. They know what's going on in the world. They can see the things that are coming. Talk about it. Well, an addendum. Um, then, like, I think... Well, how would you like to see Future Day help with this goal? Or help with uh, getting groups of people and large sums of people thinking about the future usefully? Um, I think at some point there has to be an outreach where the Futures conversation leaves places like this hall and goes out and starts to talk people out there. I mean, one of the simplest ways to engage with the future is to play with it. Future as play is a very, very... So go out there and create a future and see what, you know, do a bit of street art, you know, sort of, you know, go out there and create a future and say, this is how the world is, this is what we're doing. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the thing about it is, if you want to learn how to engage with the future, then try practising with children. Because children are natural futures thinkers. One thing I would say, while I don't think tertiary education shuts down people's ability to think this way, kids are natural futures thinkers. They absolutely don't mind going anywhere with ideas. You can learn a lot, a lot about working with ideas about the future fearlessly by actually uh, practicing with kids. Adults tend to become a little bit more conscious of, I don't want to look foolish. One of the notions in futures, you've got to be prepared to look foolish. <laughs> you've got to be prepared to look foolish. Because the future's going to be different. We have a, we have a truism in our business, I'm sure, I'm sure my students know it, it's called the, the second law. Is every, any useful idea about the future should appear ridiculous on first glance, otherwise it's not useful enough. So just, you know, be prepared to run an idea up, be, be prepared to kind of, you know, throw an idea out there to see what happens. Um, Kids have no fear in that kind of space. Adults get a bit more hung up. Sounds like something Jim Data said. Uh, it's the one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but not all useful. But not all ridiculous ideas are useful. Is of course yeah. the the kind of sting on that one. Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, 
Some colleagues of mine at the university in Hawaii. Um, Hawaii, as you know, is an island. Um, it's actually a series of islands. None of them are particularly large. And these students and Jim Data noted that climate change and particularly sea level rise was not being noted or talked about very much. Odd, you would think, on an island where everyone knows where the sea is. So what they did was they got um, basically a paintbrush and a can of blue paint and they went to the studies that said when sea level rises by you know whatever the thing is how far and they started to paint a blue line around just a blue line nothing else I think they must have asked permission to deface public property but they basically walked around and painted this blue line what do you think happened what are you doing <laughs> So the person who's planning the holiday and planning this and planning that, suddenly you're there drawing a blue line that says my house is underwater. How dare you? <laughs> I'm just painting a blue line. I'm just kind of following where science says it's going to be. It was so successful in engaging people and outraging people that they actually then people then demanded to know more about this. What, what do you mean the sea level is going to... Who's down? They actually repeated it in New York, which of course just had a recent experience of it, you know, with the hurricane. I mean, it takes, again, there's, if futures wants to be noticed, to some extent, you have to kind of get in people's faces, but you've got to do it in such a way that, you know, it's not, you know, bombastic or demolished. Just to me, find a skillful way to break the pattern of their thinking and let them get annoyed at you for disturbing how they see the world. I'm always amused by public art. People get really, really annoyed by public art. I've always wondered why that is, but of course it makes you have an opinion about it. <laughs> How dare you make me an opinion about that? I don't want to have an opinion about that. But it's there in front of you, it's demanding you to say, what is it? To some extent, futures is kind of that process as well. At some point you kind of come out and you start becoming slightly annoying. <laughs> so you have the conversation afterwards. I've got to be done, don't I? Uh, well, we've got another 15 minutes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Anybody with the David Zakura? I notice you there in the audience. Have you got anything to ask or add? Got a Nietzsche quote to give us? <laughs> classic tool for pathways thinking is what if dot 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 and if a person engages with what if and then if you turn it into how do we succeed if dot 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 is then the natural step towards it being a pathway rather than a shut down I don't like this go away you're an idiot um, because case scenario how are you going to handle it? Absolutely. I mean, once again, the Stoics, again, as the Stoics found, you know, doing, doing the worst case scenario either gives you the avocation that it's not that serious or I'll cope. But in the context of, okay, we're talking about stem cell research or we're talking about, you know, some future technology or future space, whatever, yeah. it's then getting the people to engage in the what if and how this affects you. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, the thing with, I mean, the thing with that wonderful presentation on um, on cell work and everything else, and you know, it's fantastic. I mean, a what if question to ask there is, what if this actually gets owned by corporations like, say, for example, Monsanto, who actually say, we actually want to own this and we'll sell this to the highest bidder. 
And I just asked the question, what happens if a, what happens if a corporation got their hands on this technology, patented it and said, it's our, it's our IP, um, here's what it costs to come and use it to uh, prevent cancer, and, you know. And I just, to me, that what if would then cause the question to say whether people cared about it or didn't care about it. And it's not done to say they shouldn't be doing the research, it's the, the what if question is, based on the research, <laughs> how is this useful? Or how is this taken away from us? I mean, as I see it, a lot of public money is being put in to create this public good. But also, my study of the world and history tells me that someone's going to try and make a dollar out of this. Um, and one of the ways you make a dollar is you lock up intellectual property. I mean, they've done it with genetics on plants. They've done it with some personal DNA, although the courts have come out and said you can't actually, no one can actually acquire your DNA as IP. Yeah. Is, is there any exercise which you could um, do with the crowd, like on a specific um, idea or technology that would work in 10 minutes? <laughs> depending, I mean, depending on the audience. Mm. Of course, I'm going to look for something which is going to cut through. Um, again, the sim I mean, the classic innovation technique is to reverse the situation and turn it around to the opposite to how people think about it. Um, which, of course, puts them in that difficult situation. So one of the things, for example, we just, at the university, we've just had um, some, uni some union elections that, around an enterprise agreement that was particularly bitter. And what I said to someone was, what I would like to do is have a conversation with the executive of the university and the union, and, I'd, and, and I'd, like, I'd like to ask them this question. Tell me how, from this point forward, if you get the vote you want, you fail and we're all worse off. So you, so, so you get the vote you want, and in the future we failed. Why have we failed, and what did you do about that failure? And then to ask it of the other side. Because to me, that notion that, of course, you know, it is, of course, to ask the question in such a way that what they expected, you're asking to think the opposite of that. How could we win the vote and lose the uni? And to me, that kind of question is the kind of thing that doesn't take someone, it's suddenly I have to now really think that through. If they say it's not possible, then you can say, sure, it's possible. There have been many situations where a person's, you know, won the battle and lost the war. So, as I say, try and, if it's got to be quick, then try and find something that simply turns the logic of what's currently going on to make them think of it in a different way. And, talk, and, and again, talk about something as a possible future. And they'll go, well, I can't imagine we'd fail. Well, okay, just end it, you know, humour me. Well, you know, we do X, Y and Z. Oh, okay, so... <laughs> Because what's going to happen, of course, in a vote is someone's going to win, someone's going to lose. I'd also get it, if, if, if I got the chance to ask the first question, I'd ask the second question. I probably wouldn't get the second question. But the second question would be, if you lose the vote, how, how is the university more successful? And what did you do about that? That, to me, become the pair of questions to ask a person. Which simply is two pathways from a point. The vote comes down. But before the vote comes down, what are the possibilities for you to behave as a union as, and as an executive? And have that conversation before the point is reached. It's too late now because the vote came out. <laughs> and, the, and, and the uni came out and said, now, now, we won. So, okay. Uh, very enjoyable, that. Um, and I can imagine many in the face conversations that you have. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's very encouraging that you don't have to have a big game plan, the what if and what would happen if kind of questions. Um, what I think what I'm, I'm needing is uh, a sense that we, we, there are a multitude of people working on what ifs that are go against the grain of the way things are. But, but on the other hand, when you listen to uh, the output around the G20 preparations, right? kind of massive, overwhelming uh, 
talk about David and Goliath, Goliath is even bigger and bigger. Um, but what I want to sense is, what do you think about, is there a point where the multitude of what-ifs that are on quite small scales but are everywhere, do, do they, do they um, form some resonance? I don't mean an organisation, but do they somewhere or another, do you, I'm hoping there's somewhere, that's what I'm, I'm hoping there's somewhere there'll be a massive resonance long before we get to the future, but they're like... Uh, there is, no, there, there is no doubt that if you're paying attention to what's going on, there are many voices talking about many, many possible pathways and many, many possible options. And there's a bunch of people that basically are saying, nah, trust me, this is the way, trust me, this is the way. At a personal level, first thing you've got to do is you, it comes back to, it always starts with you. You've got to hang in there. You've got to basically keep the conversation going and waiting for the opportunity. I mean, you know, will the tipping point come? Will the future suddenly foreclose? You know, will the business as usual model simply fall apart? You know, will someone come along and say the emperor's wearing no clothes? My answer is probably. I mean, the people who are in this space and doing the pathways, the alternative pathways, I mean, they can't lose hope. Because if they lose hope, it's not because of this, it's because of this. I mean, I keep coming back to this one. That if you're in the game of thinking about the future and if you're in the game of getting alternative pathways up there, you have to be able to back yourself. You've got to be able to believe you're going to get there. The key one, though, to your own personal agency is do not try and do it by yourself. It's a lonely, lonely place by yourself to be singing from a different hymn book. So find out the people who can pick you up. When you kind of say, look, you know, if I see another you know, G20 talking about X, Y and Z, I'm going to go crazy. Then have the person say, calm down, see what, you know, have a look what so-and-so said. You know, and, and find that thing that just... Because that's, I mean, that's all we can have is hope. And it, it's not small hope, it's big hope. I mean, it will change. It will change. Because the external world doesn't owe our plans or our wishes very, very much. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much.